you and I have known each other for like what four years five years maybe longer than that even yeah um yeah different psychology meetups and whatnot and I feel like a lot of our conversation centers around like communication and like analyzing communication and what happens when two people are talking um we're both kind of nerdy like that so this seemed like a cool fit yeah yeah Yeah. it was really interesting book yeah i think the ideas are great and these concepts are great and as we'll talk about super just relevant when you're being like introspective and like oh yeah i play that game all the time yeah yeah it's i mean it's only like i just recently finished going through it but Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm already like thinking about my like past interactions mm. differently. Yeah. And so like through the kind of transactional analysis lens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like why did why do I actually say what I say? <laughs> yeah. No, it has that effect for sure. And like I I mean, not to get too deep too soon, but I, I even notice like during therapy se- sessions sometimes like me saying that like oh, I was playing this game with this person or or am I playing a game right now with you? Like, are we playing I, a I game I know. Right now? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> are we playing a game right are now? Are you, what game are you playing with me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess some, so some of this stuff can, I guess, put you in your head a little bit, but I think, I think Burns' whole idea is basically that we play these games unconsciously yeah. and that by becoming conscious of them, it allows us to move past them and to get to some deeper things like intimacy and all that stuff. So I guess you gotta, you gotta go through the phase of like being in your head about it and being introspective about it. Yeah. yeah. Like, Oh, here I go again, but not overthinking it. Yeah. Right. Well, so we are kind of talking back and forth about how to structure this because there's a lot of material here, a lot of content. And this was actually not in the book, but in like a, a, interview he did in 1966 he says there's basically six ways that people spend time together like when you put two people in a room there's basically one of six things that they will do and he kind of lists them there's withdrawal procedures rituals pastimes games and intimacy and i would maybe include a seventh uh operations which he talks about a little bit but um i was thinking we could kind of format this as like we can just go through one at a time and kind of talk about like what he says each of these are, give some examples of it. Uh, yeah, that and works. Talk about some of these TA concepts along the way. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this first one is withdraw. So uh, a person is there in body, but not in mind. So an individual can remain solitary, even in the presence of others, as every school teacher knows. So he's referring here to kind of like a student who is, you know, in body in the classroom watching the lecture, but like his mind is on the other side of town, like at the swimming hole or whatever. I feel like that was most of my childhood. (laughs) Yeah. You're a big daydreamer. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Yeah. I still am. Are you you, still are? Are you not? I'm, I'm not. No, I mean, I'm not a huge daydreamer. Yeah. Like I feel like 80% of like up until college Mm -hmm. was just me like physically being there because it was a requirement (laughs) yeah like during classes and stuff like that yeah okay yeah no i i was like i never paid attention (laughs) yeah did you find yourself doing it um like when you were with people as well yeah if if it was and normally it was a group setting about a conversation I was not interested in. Okay. <laughs> you would rather withdraw than to, yes. to be present. Largely yeah. sports okay. or something like that. Okay. So or if like, we want to make you withdraw, we just start talking about yeah. football or something. Yes. Yes. That's the perfect <laughs> yeah. way to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, the, the thing I thought of, there's, um, you ever see the movie Annie Hall, the Woody Allen uh, movie? No. So there's the movie Annie Hall. There's a scene where, Annie Hall and his girlfriend are they're having sex but like she has completely withdrawn and like the way that they depict it in the movie is like you kind of see her like ghost self like get out of bed and like go over to the drawing table and like start painting and he's like I feel like you're not present like I feel like you're not here and like she's you know on the other side of the room yeah yeah I mean that's exactly like 
I like the way you're describing yeah. it is what it feels like for me. Yeah. Do you feel like you can tell when other people are doing that? Are checked out? I feel like I can. Yeah, you because you kind of see that like, it, like the eyes glazed over look. Yeah. yeah. Or if like you're talking about something and then they can't, it's like you can tell they're coming in and out because it's mm. like you missed that important detail. And if you were listening, I know ah, you would okay. like have something to say back. <laughs> Yeah, but I know because like I do it oh, very often, more often than I think I'd like. Yeah, for sure. Well, and the other thing uh, that I think is important with some of these, you know, six different ways of interaction is, I think they kind of move up from being withdrawal, being completely unconscious, to when we get to intimacy. He talks about it's just like full presence, full awareness. So as we go through these states, I think the one of the reasons he puts him in the order that he does is you're kind of moving from a, a state of you know completely unconscious disconnected to, yeah, yeah yeah so withdrawal is just completely disconnected um yeah let's move on to uh procedures so procedures uh not super exciting he says quote a series of simple complimentary adult transactions directed towards the manipulation of reality uh he says this is the f- simplest form of social activity so some examples of this would be like a doctor and patient like removing an appendix during a surgery like that's a procedure or like two people setting a dinner table um yeah just basically an action that two people are doing uh yeah there's not a whole lot there uh he does say that Sometimes people engage in procedures to avoid intimacy. So this would be like a workaholic who's just like constantly fidgeting or working in order to avoid intimacy. And that's kind of actually all of these stages. So a lot of the what motivates people to play games and all this stuff, a lot of times it's because intimacy is scary and hard and potentially threatening. Yeah. I have friends in my life who love to just do things. Yeah. And like you and I have talked, we're talking about this earlier. We like to talk. And so every time we catch (laughs) up with you, it's let's go get some tea and catch up on Mm -hmm. what's going on. And then I have like friends on the other side of the spectrum where just like, let's go do this activity, like Mm -hmm. ride seagulls. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And to me, it always feels like, oh, this is like something to do where we're not actually fully connecting, Mm. but like you're not totally withdrawn because you're physically there actually. Yeah. I I definitely have friends like that. I have a buddy like that. Who's constantly like doing out like dirt, dirt, dirt bike riding, like hiking, snowboarding. Like he just always wants to be doing something. Yeah. And there's other friends. Yeah. Who could just be happy, like having a conversation. Um, and then, all right. So the next one is what he calls rituals. So we have, basically two different kinds of rituals. There's what he calls a formal ritual, which is a ritual that doesn't have a lot of room for variation. So something like um, like a Catholic mass is pretty much the same in any part of the world. It's pretty much the same no matter who the priest is, no matter what time of year it is, it's pretty much just always the same script. Um, whereas an informal ritual is something wh- like a greeting ritual. So like, you know, hi, hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Nice weather we're having. That would be like a greeting ritual, but it's going to change based on what culture you're in, how well the people know each other, whether they're in a hurry. So there's a little bit more Your room mood. for variation. Mood, yeah, for sure. And um, he says greetings are not about an exchange of information. So it's not really about like, oh, that person just told me how the weather is. Like, good to know that fact. It's a formality. You don't do it, then you're like weird. Yeah, exactly. It is a a kind of... You're breaking the like unspoken rule of how we should act. Exactly. Yeah, it is an unspoken... And he gets into talking about greetings are a way that we kind of stroke each other. And he talks a lot about this idea of like emotional stroking. And maybe we could talk about that a bit before we get further into rituals. Yeah. Okay. So 
yeah, he actually starts the book talking about stroking. And he basically says, like, when you look at, like, the science, children who are not physically held and handled when they're very young, like, either die or their health deteriorates really fast. And um, I don't know what he was going off of, but I have heard this with, like, there was some orphanage in Romania, I think it was, where they had, like, a bunch of orphans, and they just kind of, like, put them in these rooms and didn't have anybody, like, touching them or interacting with them. And a lot of them died, and a lot of them grew up to be, like, pretty pretty psychologically messed up. That's actually, did, like, that's a volunteer position, like, actually in hospitals oh really to go in for and like just like like preemie babies a baby hmm. uh, or maybe it's not just preemies but okay. it's really hard to get this volunteer position i've tried yeah there's one in <laughs> there's brooklyn a lot of people that would people want that. yeah so you yeah. come in and all you do is just cuddle babies like yeah. little <laughs> like like tiny i don't know how much wow preemies weigh, but like two pounds three pounds yeah. and you just cuddle them and it's supposed to like Somebody's got to do it. Help them feel connected and like mm. stay healthy. Yeah, and like he says, like if if they don't have this, their their health deteriorates really fast. And then he kind of draws a parallel to emotional stroking. So he's kind of saying, well, okay, so when we're first born, we need this like physical stroking to take place, and then as we get older, we no longer have our mother or parent doing this stroking. And we need to then find a way to kind of get it elsewhere. So he does what we call like seeking out symbolic stroking. So this would be like getting like a nod of recognition or like a compliment from somebody else. I sometimes feel that need to like Mm. stroke. Like even I'm just sitting here watching you talk. I feel the need to nod and mm. get like it's like a, I'm stroking you like yeah. yeah 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 come on what you're saying makes sense that's good keep going yeah. but like you're not asking me to provide that <laughs> yeah it's like I just feel like okay let me yeah. like make sure that like you know Zach knows that I'm engaged <laughs> right right yeah exactly well and it's I think it goes really deep and getting back to when we're talking about rituals He says at another point, it's almost as though people have a little machine or cash register in their head that was figuring out how much hello you said and how much they owe you back. So when we're doing engaging in these like greeting rituals, if somebody is just like, oh, hey, Ted, nice to see you. It's oh, so great to see you. How's the family doing? And then Ted's just like, good. Totally. They would be like, wait a minute. I just gave them like 30 strokes and they returned back one like. That that we, calculation uh, isn't checking out, and we do it subconsciously. Like I know for a fact <laughs> that I do this. I can say like at my job, there mm. are people who go out of their way to like talk and converse and how are you doing and like listen to you. And with those people, I do when I'm in like a work setting. Mm. Those are the people that I gravitate more towards. The strokers. Yeah. 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 And I'm just like, I feel the need to be nicer to them and be like, to go up and like ask them questions about like, you know, their commute over, like what Mm. they thought of the event we just went through. But it's the other people where I'm just like, I don't care. (laughs) Well, yeah. And I think that's another point that he has is like each uh, kind of relationship that you have you have this unwritten agreement of how many strokes is appropriate between us. Yeah. So it might be the fact that like, you know, me and my best friend are on like a 30 stroke basis if we ran into each other. But like, you know, for me personally, like me and my barber, we're on like a two stroke basis of like, hey, hey, cool. Right. See you later. And but you both know it's it's unspoken yeah. rule. And the thing that is just like mind blowing to me is how we just know. This sounds like such mm-hmm. a complicated calculation. Yeah. But most people just know. Yeah. We're like not everyone, but like there are a lot of people who just know. Like this is the type of relationship mm. that's established. We don't talk about it. Like this is what we're what we're gonna say, and we end it there. Totally. And then I guess the other thing there's also the variable of like how long it's been since the two people saw each other. So this was from the book. He says, quote, let us now consider Mr. C and Mr. D who pass each other about once a day, trade one stroke each, high, high, and go their ways. Mr. C goes on a month's vacation. 
The day after he returns, he encounters Mr. D as usual. If on this occasion, Mr. D merely says hi and no more, Mr. C will be offended. His, <laughs> his spinal cord will shrivel slightly. By his calculations, Mr. D and he owe each other at least 30 strokes. Yeah, so I think that's, that's funny. And I think at another point he says, like, if two people have just finished stroking each other and then they see each other again, like, a couple minutes later, the, the stroking will be much less or not at all. And uh, I've had that. Ha I had that happen another a couple of weeks ago. I was at um, my Muay Thai class, and uh, I like walked out with my Muay Thai instructor, and we were kind of, yeah, having this like, you know, stroking conversation. Oh, how's it going? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it sounds so weird. It does sound really. It does, it doesn't, it sounds inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, it does sound. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Uh, <laughs> nothing below the belt. This is a P. This is a PG. <laughs> Uh, podcast. podcast now <laughs> yeah but we're yeah we're basically like have you know bullshitting oh like how long you've been taking classes like that kind of thing and then he left and i stayed i was like checking something on my phone and he came back because he forgot something and i was just like hey and he just walked past <laughs> it was very much just like no no, no we just stroked each other right. we don't have any new information to convey like my initiating another stroke was like out of line in that context you don't think he just didn't hear you no he definitely he heard, heard me. you <laughs> he was, he's, he's like a tough dude okay. like this is like a street fighter yeah yeah, yeah. He was i just get like, it's nah, like bro. this is enough and so we've like this i've had we had our fill and so <laughs> yeah. this is my boundary we're done here yeah he also says that if somebody strokes too much the other person will grow sus suspicious it's just like you know i think he says something like um yeah, this is from the book. He says, as Mr. F hurries away, he thinks to himself, what's come over him all of a sudden? Is he selling insurance or something? <laughs> In transactional terms, he reads, all he owes me is one stroke. Why is he giving me five? So yeah, we're suspicious of people who stroke too much. Yeah. Well, yeah, so that's that's rituals, or at least the greeting ritual. Um, maybe we can talk about pastimes a little bit. Yeah. All right, so pastimes... Uh, this is from the book, quote, a series of semi-ritualistic, simple complementary transactions arranged around a single field of material whose primary object is to structure an interval of time. I might get a little bit of flack for saying this, but it's basically small talk um, for all intents and purposes. <laughs> yeah. And he, he talks about small talk a bit, but you said your favorite yeah. in a cringy way. <laughs> You're not a fan. No. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he says pastimes are typically played at parties. Uh, there's usually several different pastimes being played at something like a cocktail party. And some of the examples he gives in the book of different pastimes, um, how much, which is just like a group of people talking about, oh, how much does that cost? Um, ever been, group of people saying like, oh, you ever been to Taiwan? Um, do you know? People pocketing like, oh, do you know so-and-so? What became of, like, oh, whatever became of uh, your friend Joe? Um, morning after, I thought this was a funny one. This is like a type of small talk which when people discuss the wild night that they had the night before. Uh, it makes me think of uh, Dave Chappelle has a joke that, like, he doesn't smoke weed with white people because all they do is talk about other times that they smoke weed. <laughs> 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 like, yeah. So I guess, yeah. When white people smoke weed, they just like to play morning after, <laughs> play this game. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of typical ones. Ge General Motors, basically just guys talking about cars, who won, guys talking about sports. Um, I thought this was interesting. He says, a good party host will often facilitate the pastimes that the party guests are playing. So they're kind of going around and, you know, because usually the host or hostess is the person that knows everybody. So they're kind of like, oh, you two, like you guys both like cars. Why don't you play General Motors together? Or like, you know, you, you two, you both are into psychology. Like, why don't you talk about this? So he says, quote, a good hostess takes the situation in hand immediately and states the program. Uh, Come now, girls, you've been playing wardrobe long enough. Mr. J here is a surgeon. I'm sure he'd like to play look ma no hands, wouldn't you, Mr. J? 
Has this ever happened to you at a party where the hostess kind of like sets you up with somebody uh, yeah, else I'm, to play? I, a, I'm a the password? person who does. That. Oh, you're the you're the <laughs> okay, nice. Um, What's your yeah. secret? Uh, like my secret to doing it, yeah, or why I do it. What's I, more you, important? Both, I guess. I don't know if I have a secret to doing it. I think it's just these two people could have something in common. I mean, I mm-hmm. did that when my good friend from San Francisco moved to New York, and I'm like, she's new to New York. Oh, you yeah. should meet my friend Zach. You guys could oh, have totally. a ton to talk yeah. about. Uh, and so when I invite people over to my house, I do the same thing. Like, mm. just try to like get people to build connections together. Yeah, yeah, totally. Do you find yourself doing that? I so the one time I threw a party at my house, I was like too busy cooking to. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a disaster. I, I didn't realize how much time cooking would take, so I wasn't really being a good host in other areas. But I have noticed like. I had a friend, I was at a Halloween party, and he he was kind of doing this. Um, and he, like, I don't know if he was trying to set up set me up with a, a, another girl, but he walked over to her and was and me and was just like, hey, Zach, you should meet, I forget her name, you should meet Julie. Like, And then he's like, Zach just hiked part of the App- Appalachian Trail. And then he left. So it was just <laughs> me very much just like... <laughs> I guess that's what we'll I, talk yeah. about. Like, yeah. And she's like, oh, cool. Like, how long are you? So it was very much just him stating, like, you here, you two play this little game. Yeah. And how did how did you perceive that conversation? Was it um, like, did it still feel organic, even though someone was coming? Like, someone handed you an agenda. Here, you talk about this topic <laughs> with this person. It felt a little bit like, um, I don't know. Well, I don't. Yeah, it felt a little awkward just because, like, it was framed as, like, me having to kind of, like, brag about myself. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, oh, I just met this person. Like, I wasn't planning on being in this type of scenario. But, I mean, it was fine. Yeah. The other cool thing I thought about pastimes, he was saying, like, if two people are playing a pastime and somebody else joins and tries to play a different pastime, that the people get really mad so uh this is i can't yeah. did he talk about why that happens so here's a quote and maybe it kind of alludes to why so he says quote a party of women who drop in at each other's house every morning for coffee to play delinquent husband which is basically where these women are just complaining about their husband are likely to give a cool reception to a new neighbor who wants to play sunny side up which is basically the game of like, oh, look how great my husband is. Um, If they are saying how mean their husbands are, it is too disconcerting to have a newcomer declare that her husband is just marvelous and they will likely not keep her for very long. It makes me think of that mean girl scene where they were all like, did you ever see that movie? Yeah, yeah, but remind, remind me what scene you're talking about. So they were all like, complaining about parts of their body i don't remember the girl's name oh names. Like, i know what you're talking about oh this is like they all like look like barbie dolls and just mm-hmm. like oh this this part of my body is like a little bit like this and then the girl the who wasn't Lindsay lohan Lindsay yeah. lohan was like didn't know what to say and they all looked at her like you need to say something you, putting yourself down and so she all she can think of is sometimes my breath smells in the morning <laughs> and they all looked at her as if she was just like she had just said something so insulting to yeah. them yeah yeah that's totally it that's totally it well at least she played the game because if she would have said something positive about herself then it would have been like oh no you've got to go girl like we're yeah. all there's actually a uh amy schumer skit which is very similar was like a bunch of women all saying like oh i look so ugly in this dress and like oh you know my skin looks terrible and then one girl shows up and she's and they were like oh you look great and she's just like thanks and then they all just like their heads start to explode Uh they like pull out a gun and like shoot themselves because it's like no no you've you're clearly not playing this game with us yeah i feel like it's it's just very like tribal to Mm. me right it's like oh, you're not fitting in with us right now. You must not be part of our tribe. Yeah, I think that's, I think that is, yeah, he doesn't explicitly say why this happens, but I think it is kind of that. Yeah. Or it could just be that like misery loves company type of thing. Yeah. Because I think the opposite thing happens. Like I surround myself with a lot of 
positive people. And if I'm hanging out with a lot of my friends and we're like, you know, more or less positive and somebody just comes in and starts complaining, like they're not playing the sunny side up game in that instance. Yeah. And they can sometimes get like, you know, the kind of turn of the eye, like, wait a minute. No, no, like, we're not. You're not part of our group. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, well, yeah. And then he kind of gets into like, why do we engage in these pastimes? And, uh, there's a few reasons. So they allow people to stroke one another and, um, it can be also a way of avoiding intimacy. And the other one that I found kind of interesting, it allows people to unconsciously kind of vet who they want to have more comp complex relationships with, or like who who they might want to have intimacy with or games with. So it's kind of like a screening process. Mm. Maybe you think of like, maybe like, like a first a, date. Yeah. You're kind of doing Like an these. HR screen in, in yeah. an interview. Mm, yeah. We're having like that pastime and it's like, okay, well, if this person, you know, talks about cars or whatever and I'm enjoying that, then like maybe we'll have a deeper connection it, or if not, like I'm screening yeah. you out. Yeah. Well, so the next stage is games. And that's like, you know, mainly what this book's about, games people play. But before we get into games, I think we probably will have to talk about some of this terminology in transactional analysis to kind of understand how he thinks about games. So, um, so yeah, let's talk about what he calls ego states. So... In Burns' estimation, we all have these three ego states, which are ego states are a system of feeling accompanied by a set of behavioral patterns. And there's three of them. There's a parent ego state, a child ego state, and an adult ego state. And he says at any moment in an interaction, a person is behaving and responding from one of these three places. Right. And uh, during like a interaction both people can be shifting between between these so um yeah the parent ego state is uh you think feel and behave in ways your parents or authority figures acted when you were growing up and there's kind of two different manifestations of the parent there's the controlling parent uh who's very kind of like judgmental seeking to manipulate um, and the nurturing parent who wants to look after people. So then the child, this is, you think, feel, and behave just like you did in your childhood. So, and then there's two different manifestations of the child ego state. This is the adapted child is you act in ways you did as a child when you adapted your behavior to authority figures. Uh, so like you feel shameful, embarrassed, apologetic, like you did when you were a child or the free child. Um, which, like the name suggests, you act in ways you did as a child when you didn't have a care in the world. Um, you had no consideration for others. You just kind of did whatever you wanted to do. And then the adult is uh, you think, feel, and behave in the here and now and are able to draw on your full life experience. The adult is more objective, realistic, um, and the other thing to kind of mention about these three is Byrne thinks that the parent and the child ego states are conditioned into us when we're very young and that a lot of times when we're acting from them they're just kind of unconsciously coming up whereas the adult seems to be as the name suggests like a much more adult rational way of you know going about things right so yeah i think where it gets interesting is when we start looking at these interactions between people and seeing how they are speaking from like one of their ego states to the other person's so like um this is where really where we get into like the transactional analysis part of the whole thing all right so i know this is a lot of stuff up front but it's necessary to kind of understand the rest of what we'll talk about so Complementary transactions, this is when a person responds from the ego state that the other place person directed their stimulus to. So this would be like my parent talking to your parent and then your parent talking to my parent. 
or my child talking to your child or my adult talking to your adult um, or my parent talking to your child and then your child talking back. As long as the ego state that I'm directing towards you, you are then coming from that and coming back to the one that I directed. There's balance. Like yeah. it's fluid, it flows. Like it's like, a, it's a, like it, it's accepted. That's that's mm. kind of how I think about it. It's like the parent talking to the kid, the kid expects it and accepts it. Yeah, exactly. So I think to, to kind of really understand these, we can look at some examples. And we were talking before, it might be fun to kind of like act Role these play. out, yeah. <laughs> roll these out. <laughs> And this is where he gets really analytical because it's like he talks about these as being like player one and player two. So in a uh, parent-child interaction, which is complimentary, if I'm player one, I'm speaking from my parent to your child, and then you're speaking from your child to my parent. So the scenario here is like I'm, in a, I'm a boss and you're an employee ju who just came in late. All right, so... If I'm speaking from my parent to your child, you're useless. I know, I'm really sorry. All right, yeah, so yeah. Your I know I'm really sorry is the child speaking to the parent. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's complimentary because you reacted from the place that I directed it to. Mm -hmm. I accepted it. Like, okay, yeah. you're the position of authority. Exactly. And then to understand the uh, complex transactions or excuse me cross transactions so this is when the person responds from a different ego state than the one that the other player directed their stimulus to so maybe we can do the same two examples where i'm in the first the boss employee example i'm yeah. speaking from my parent to your child but then you reply from your parent to my child so this would be okay wait sorry <laughs> No worries. We could also yeah. just wing it. Totally. You want to just, yeah. yeah, let's just wing it. Okay. So I'm the boss speaking for my parent to your child. Yeah. You're late. You're useless. I'm like two minutes late. I'm not the useless one. Was All that right. not a good, yeah, that, that was, was great. That a good example? Okay. No, that was great. That was great. <laughs> right. So yeah, you, you responded from your parent to my child. Yeah. So we're kind of at a standstill there. And what he says is with these kind of cross transactions is they will either like just come to a halt, which is kind of what happened there. I was kind of like not expecting that. I was expecting you to be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, what can I do? Whereas you were like, you don't talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. Then it's like what he says is basically what will then happen is one person will have to switch to make it complimentary. So let's do it again, and this time I'll switch to my child. Yeah. All right. Where were you? You're 10 minutes late. You're useless. I'm not, I'm not the useless one, and it's only 10 minutes. You need to relax. Oh, um, yeah, no, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, no, just, just come in. Um, yeah, can I, can I get you anything? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's like me. So then you're, back, you're backing down. Backing down, and... Yeah, responding keeping, to and your... keeping the harmony. Yeah, for sure. By the way, just to shout out, I got a few of these examples from um, like a YouTuber, Theremin Trees. So just to give credits where credits due, that's where these like last couple examples came from. But I thought it illustrates this beautifully. You can yeah. kind of see, you know, me as player one in that last instance, like very much change which ego state I'm coming from. Um. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about parent, child. Maybe we can just go through a few of these other composite, uh, other um, combinations. Yeah. Child, child. This is another complimentary, which a lot of times this just takes on the form of play. So this could be actually like two children playing or um, some of these games like uh, Would You Rather or like Never Have I Ever or like uh, Mary Fuck Kill. You know that one? Yeah. That's very much a child child where it's it's not really about an exchange of information. It's more about like a game. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I so I played all those games in 
in college. Yeah. But for me, they were about, it's like, I wanted to get to know oh, really? my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so you were very much coming from the adult objective, like. Yeah, yeah. I have never thought about it until you said that. I'm like, mm. it wasn't just like, it actually was an exchange of information. I loved playing it because I'm like, mm. I felt like, oh, now I know this person so much better. Now they know me better. Interesting. Interesting. I had a, um, a, a girlfriend who loved that would, would you rather game. Yeah. And she would just come up with these like insane examples. Like, would you rather have like blue eyebrows or like 10 foot long armpit hair just like weird stuff right but yeah i guess i guess she was learning about me in some way but it's felt more like the objective was just play right okay but for you you were like collecting information i'm serious yeah, like, <laughs> this is about <laughs> learning not fun yeah. zach <laughs> yeah. well i guess yeah if some of those like yeah if you ask somebody like how would you rather fly be able to fly or be invisible yeah. You are kind of learning about them. Right, yeah. right. And just because then you either explicitly ask them why or I formulate my own conclusions as to okay. why. <laughs> nice. Well, then, yeah, I guess that's a bit of like, because the one we haven't talked about is adult, adult, yeah. which is basically the example he gives in the book of the um, husband saying like, have you seen my cufflinks? And the wife says, they're on the table. Yeah. So it's not the most interesting right. transaction, but it's basically just conveying information right. to one another from this like objective, mature state. And um, yeah, so I guess playing like would you rather could be an adult adult. You are, you are conveying information to one yeah. another. The one last kind of bit of housekeeping before we get into games is he talks about there's two different levels of an interaction. There's the social level. And then there's the psychological level. So the social level is very much like what is being said, the kind of denotative aspect. And then the psychological level is more of like, yeah, what's happening at the psychological level or what is felt. And so the most simple kind of a transaction would be a superficial transaction where what is being said is the same as what is happening on the psychological level. So we go back to our adult adult example where the husband's like, do you mm -hmm. know where my cufflinks are? And the wife's yep. like, they're on the desk. That's a superficial because yeah, it's what is happening uh, on both levels is the same. But then we have what's called a, what he calls an ulterior transaction, which is where what is happening psychologically does not match what is being said. And this is where we get into this is really the heart of games. So the example from the book was like a flirtatious game where what's happening on the social level seems to be adult adult, just seems to be this conveyance of information. But on the psychological level, uh, for like a flirtatious game, it's child child play. So this is a, he uses an example from the book, but it was like a little dated and not really, it didn't really translate. Actually, I might just scratch this example because this one's really okay. weird. I'm just going to do the um, the one I because it I think makes a little more sense. Okay. So on the social level, it would sound like this. Are you good at riding the bull? <laughs> oh, I can ride the bull all night long. <laughs> yeah. So it seems to be like, OK, it could be just be an adult adult exchange of information like oh she's really good at right and people that aren't good at flirting like just take it on this level of just like oh no she just told me that she's good at riding the bull but really on the psychological level it sounds more like the man is saying are you good in bed and she's saying very good very good <laughs> yeah so that would that's what would make it a game is this disconnect between the social level and the psychological level yeah i guess it's a way of like avoiding the awkwardness because yeah. it's like, oh, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> yeah. So if this makes you uncomfortable, it's a joke, <laughs> right? Right, you have some so plausible deniability. You deniability. hide it, yes. Yeah. So you hide it. You don't come out and explicitly say right. that. And there's also some cultural, it's like not acceptable to say that, right? You, you, you yeah. look like a perv you come up if you for said a drink. that. Yeah. yeah, if you said, do you want to come up for some sex? Yeah, like, it, would, that's just too much it's and too not much. socially and, and you don't have like 
the plausible deniability. Right. Like, no, it was oh, an I innocent was, drink. Yeah. I was just asking if she wanted to come up for, if, if she's just like, oh, how dare you? And, and then you'd, like, you'd blame them. No, that's you. <laughs> yeah. You are reading too much into this. Even if yeah. both people know. Oh, yeah. And that's what makes it a game. Uh huh. Or like Netflix and chill. Yeah. Right. If somebody says you want to Netflix and chill and they're like, fuck you, you can be like, well, I just wanted to watch Netflix. Yeah. I, mean, I think maybe Netflix not and chill is like, <laughs> pretty obvious that one's become too much yeah you don't have a whole lot of plausible no deniability. no i yeah. think that's that is pretty explicit but maybe in the, maybe in the early days of netflix and chill be- yeah, before it right. became the uh, I, yeah cliche all right we see how much game you have Zach. <laughs> yeah. my lines don't Expose work it all out on your podcast yeah, exactly. <laughs> well you want to go through a few of these games yeah yeah let's do it one of them that stuck out to me was called Look Ma, No Hands. And these titles are really funny because they kind of, <laughs> at least for me, give you an image. I imagine like a little kid swinging on a swing set and saying like, look, mom, no hands. Um, so the moves in this game, player one says or does something with the intent of showing off to player two to get a stroke or approval of recognition. And then player two awards player one with a stroke. So some examples of this uh, would be like a man on a date disguising a brag about himself as though he is just providing factual information. So on the social level, again, it's adult, adult, but on the psychological level, it's child to parent. So at the social level, it would sound like, sorry, I'm late. I was cleaning my yacht. Oh, you have a yacht. You must be really rich. <laughs> yeah. So that would, and then on the psychological level, what that actually kind of sounds like would be, look at what I have. Please give me a stroke. Yes. Here's your stroke. <laughs> 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 yeah. Exactly. And I feel is, like that is such, like, that's a really good example. Like people, mm. I feel like every day I'm encountering some type of interaction like this. Yeah. I, and it happens more in the dating world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where one person's trying to kind of validate themselves. Yeah, right. And um, here's proof <laughs> that I'm a catch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be like m- me as player one initiating from my child to your parent. But I think this game can also be played with kind of player two initiating from the parent. So I thought of like a pickup artist, a lot, some of the tactics in like pickup artistry is basically teaching guys how to flip the script and get the woman to kind of validate herself to him. So this is kind of an example I thought of would be like the pickup artist saying something like, you're you're beautiful, yes, but beauty fades. What else do you have going for you? Well, I have my master's in electrical engineering, and I'm also really into reading classic novels. Whoa, cool. I guess there is more than meets the eye. Yeah. Is this, see, this one, does that work? <laughs> like... This is what they teach up in the... Yeah, this is this, like... This works? Like, that's how women respond? Well, I think what it's getting at is, yeah, it's trying to kind of, again, it's still setting up this child parent dynamic, but it's, it's basically teaching a guy to put himself in the parent role and to kind of, you know, manipulate her into being in the child role. So what's happening, manipulate her into being that one bragging about the yacht, like, no, no. I am worthy of your time. Right, right. That's just an example of a way that it can be initiated by the parent. Yep. Kind of, oh, impress me. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a million examples of this one. I mean, this one also isn't, I know we're using some dating examples, but this is, happens happens everywhere. Everywhere, at work. Yeah. With friends. Yeah. I definitely play this game yeah, even sometimes with my therapist, I'm like, have to be like, did I tell you that because I wanted your validation? Oh, yeah. It, right? I feel like this comes out, but that's what therapy is. You're like, mm. you're some relationship with the yeah. therapist that you've 
often it's child parent. It is, yeah. The parent as the therapist. That's the kind of transference yeah. thing happening. Yeah. Anything I say to my therapist, I'm staring at her facial reaction. Is she going to smile? Is she going to nod? <laughs> and then I feel hurt when yeah. I don't get that validation because it's like, but you're like my parent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want that stroke. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I, I, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of the Freudian therapy where the, the therapist is just behind you right because you i'm good see. at i'm good at reading body language and like facial cues so sometimes yeah. when i'm saying something i don't even look at my therapist because i'm like i don't even want to see how you're reacting to this like i i'd rather just say it yeah that's the healthier way <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. but yeah i mean this, so this is i think this is just such a common one and why i kind of picked it as the first one to do to go yeah. through um yeah maybe we can move on to the, the yeah. next one yeah no. All right, this next one's great. This next one's called Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch. <laughs> and kind of the Catchy move- title. <laughs> yeah, it is. So the moves in this game, uh, player two tries to pull one over on player one or get away with something. And player one learns of the deception. And then player one waits for player two to fall into their trap. And then player one scorns player two for their deception. And the classic example of this he uses um in the book is a game of poker so player one is dealt like a really great hand but then player one doesn't bet big so in poker speak he slow plays the hand and then player two bets really big and they basically are bluffing trying to buy the pot and then player one thinks ah now i've got you you son of a bitch and then they gleefully call their bet and raise them all in. So it's like, you fell into my trap, and now I'm going to make you pay. Right. So he gives the example of a plumber and a customer. And the plumber gives the customer a quote about how much the installation is going to cost and promises the customer there's not going to be any additional costs. But then after the installation, the plumber includes a few extra costs. And the customer thinks, ah, now I've got you, you son of a bitch. And they gleefully write the plumber an angry letter and complain about, hey, you said I wasn't going to be charged for this and you charged me. And then, you know, the plumber backs down and removes the cost. And I guess the payoff for player one, the one who's catching player two in the act, uh, they're able to offload all of their rage onto player two. Um, they enjoy kind of holding this power over the other person. And um, he also says in the book they're able to avoid their own, confronting their own shortcomings. I've noticed a few examples of this. Have you have you noticed this one or, or not so much? I can't think of any off the top of my head. What, like, yeah. what are your examples? So I sell comedy tickets in Times Square and there is a two-drink minimum for customers to come to the show and i always try to tell customers about that like right up front but i've had a few instances where i've forgotten to tell them until after they've gone to pay for the tickets and then they've see on the tickets like hey it says on here two drink minimum and they're kind of saying like now i've got you you son of a bitch like you tried to pull one over on me and I'm usually just like, oh shit, like sorry, like I didn't mean to do that. I mean, it could be a sales right. tactic, yeah, right, to just be like, oh, you already committed, and like right. I'm just not going to tell you about this negative. But um, but then I'm curious. Then when you say like, oh, I'm sorry, like, do you refund them? Like, or if you offer to refund, do they accept and say, yeah, give it back, or they're like, oh, it was an honest mistake. That's fine. Fortunately, the two times that it's happened they've believed me because it really has because sometimes you know i have like my script but sometimes they'll be asking these questions way out of order like how much does it cost where is it and then like i don't remember what all i've told them yeah and then they're already going to buy and like in that instance they were just like you didn't tell me about this and i was like well i i meant to like trust me yeah and then so yeah. they when you back down yeah right so in the plumber example yeah right he backed down he backs down does the other person then return to like, oh, okay, let's keep keep the transaction as is then, like, and believe yeah. you? Um, yeah, for, for me so far, that's been what's happened, but 
I wouldn't be surprised if like in the future, if it happens again, they were just like, don't believe me. And like, fuck you. Like, give me my money. Yeah. Back. You try yeah. to pull one over on me. Like get out of here, which is kind of, uh, at least in Burns estimation, like that, that player is kind of waiting for them to make that mistake so that they can mm-hmm. offload all of this rage into like, aha, like that's why it's like, aha, now I've got you, you right. son of a bitch. It's like you're anticipating somebody yeah. scamming you. <laughs> the other example, do you watch The Office? Yeah. So there's an episode in The Office where Dwight goes behind Michael's back to Jan to try to get his job. And then Michael finds out about it, but doesn't tell him right away that he knows. And then he's playing this like, oh, where did you go? And he's like, oh, I went to the dentist. And he's like, oh, interesting. What's your dentist's name? So he's kind of <laughs> holding this power over him. Uh-huh. And he's thinking in his mind, like, now I've got you, you son of a bitch. Like, I have caught you. And, like, I'm going to make you pay. Yeah. And he does. I think he makes him wear a sign that says liar. On it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do not remember that episode, okay. but oh, okay. it does sound like a Michael Scott thing to do. Yeah. All right, so then another one is this, uh, he calls, Why Don't You Yes But? <laughs> and this is, the moves in this game, player one presents a problem to a person or a group of people, and then player two or the group take turns offering a solutions, usually starting with, why don't you? And then player one objects every solution, starting with, yes, but you know this won't work because so-and-so. So this game appears to be an adult adult problem solving transaction. Um, however, Burns says the purpose of this game is not to get suggestions. The purpose of this game is to reject the set the suggestions and to feel a feeling of gratification and superiority over the people who weren't able to offer solutions. And that ultimately, when the other person or the group is left silent after they've run out of solutions, the player one feels like a certain sense of superiority of like, oh, I won. Like I was able to give a reason why all of these things wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Is there one to act out? Yeah, there's a example in the book. So this, the example in the book is um, this, a woman is seeking solutions for her friends about her husband's poor carpentry. You want to be player one? Sure. Okay. My husband always insists on doing our own repairs, and he never builds anything right. Well, why doesn't he take a course in carpentry? Yeah, yes, but he doesn't have time. Well, why don't you buy him some good tools? <laughs> yes, but he doesn't know how to use them. Well, why don't you have your building done by a carpenter? Yeah, but that would cost too much money. Oh. Uh... <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's usually how that game ends. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a drum student who likes to play this game. <laughs> she, oh, yeah? Yeah. And it, it, I when I was reading this book, I thought of her immediately because every lesson kind of started out with like, oh, how was your week? And then she would, you know, complain about her week or like some test that was coming up. And I would try to be optimistic. And then she would be like, yeah, but yeah, but. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we're just playing this game. Oh, yeah. I have I definitely have had some friends who are like that. It's yeah. like, okay, you just want to complain and then (laughs) put my ideas down so basically yeah well cool well maybe we can talk a little bit about this sixth stage this sixth way of interacting uh, which he calls intimacy so he also titles that chapter beyond games Mm -hmm. and it was just a little short couple of chapters in the book but I found it super interesting. Um, You know, he's, he's saying what makes intimacy intimacy is, he says, quote, intimacy is a game free, candid, frank relationship. And then he says, intimacy means the spontaneous game free candidness of an aware person, the liberation um, of the uncorrupted child in all its naivete living in the here and now. This is the enlightened one. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, essentially. So this is like, yeah, what he calls like an adult, adult transaction, but it's allowing this, what he calls the 
uncorrupted child to come out in each person. It's almost like a Buddhist idea. It's kind of like the the idea of like beginner's mind of like, you know, if you already think that you know everything, you can't learn anything or you can't experience anything authentically and Mm -hmm. that this the child is essentially like experiencing everything for the first time and just conscious and aware because when we're playing games and i should have said this earlier uh these games he thinks are almost all happening at the unconscious level and they're just us like running our programming so intimacy is kind of this awareness that it takes to you know, rise above that. And I don't know. I thought that was an interesting framing of it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I've never thought of intimacy as being something that requires like full consciousness and awareness because in his view, he's kind of like, otherwise we resort back into playing games. Right. And he talks about something else in here. He just briefly mentioned, he doesn't even spend a paragraph. He calls it an operation, which is, um, kind of to me seemed like a form of intimacy he says an operation is a simple transaction or set of transactions undertaken for a specific stated purpose if someone frankly asks for reassurance and gets it that is an operation which differs from a game in that like a lot of times a player in a game is trying to get reassurance or recognition but is going about it a very backhanded way. way yeah. So I thought of like if somebody in an operation, somebody might say something like, I'm feeling really insecure right now in how I look and I need you to reassure me and tell me I look pretty. Yeah. Which is very rare. So somebody would say that. But that would be like an operation. And I would think kind of like a form of intimacy. Whereas the game version of that would be like, oh, I look so ugly in this dress. You're so much prettier than I am. And then just like waiting for a compliment. Yeah, I feel like somebody maybe, I just think of like attachment theory. And so somebody Mm. who's really well, like that in that example, that's somebody's insecure attachment coming out. And so Uh, when you're aware of it, you're able to then take that and communicate it Mm. in a healthier way of saying like, hey, I need some validation from you right now in order for our relationship to, to exist in harmony and so like yeah you need to be really aware of like all of this subconscious bs yeah. <laughs> that that we all have right well yeah and somebody when they are saying like oh i'm so ugly like they might not actually realize that the thing that they are wanting is that reassurance yeah, yeah. You, so it takes a certain level of uh, self-awareness. self-awareness to be like yeah and then maturity to then communicate that and, yeah and admit and, that right and it's, a, you have to be right. vulnerable to say like i'm feeling insecure right now absolutely yeah. vulnerability and then also comfort in the other side like mm. you wouldn't say this to somebody who you knew was going to put you down but somebody who you know is going to be open and receptive towards it. yeah so this per i feel safe with this person i can tell them how i can wear my heart on my sleeves and tell them how i'm feeling and they will re- reciprocate and meet my needs Totally. Yeah. You need to be able to trust that yeah. person on some level because mm-hmm. yeah, if you're like, oh, I'm feeling really insecure right now and like, I need you to tell me I look pretty. They might, they might be like, be that's like, not my job. And yeah. then you just feel worse. Yeah. 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 Right. You could backfire. And, oh yeah. Yeah. Just a, com- a complicated <laughs> situation. A lot of, uh, things have to exist for that to even be able to work out. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he says like, most people settle for games because intimacy is so hard and he it's kind of a little pessimistic towards the end he's like n- n- all of humanity is not going to be able to experience intimacy maybe a select few are yeah. able are going to be able to like rise above this conditioning and like actually actually get there um i thought that was kind of interesting maybe i'll just read the last paragraph of this because i think there's a lot of nuggets yeah. Um, all right. So he says, quote, for certain fortunate people, there is something which transcends all classifications of behavior, and that is awareness, something which rises above the programming of the past, and that is spontaneity, and something that is more rewarding than games, and that is intimacy. But all three of these, 
may be frightening and even perilous to the unprepared. Perhaps they are better off as they are seeking their solutions in popular techniques of social actions such as togetherness. This may mean there is no hope for the human race, but there is hope for the individual members of it. That's a good closing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Paragraph, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, this was awesome. Yeah. This was a bunch of fun. I and, agree. Uh, and yeah. I'm glad that we finally got to do this because we have been talking about it since oh my like gosh. Yeah. February when yeah. I was living across the country. <laughs> I know. You were, yeah, you were like riding camels and all kinds of stuff. I was. N- I was in California. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, I, don't I think swear I saw something. You we, were on a camel. Yeah, but we talked about me doing a podcast okay. with you. It was like back in like January or yeah. February. Right. When I was still living in San Francisco. Well, we got to do it in person, which is so much better. Yeah, Just way like better. Yeah, right on I agree. And, and yeah, way, in way a swanky more fun. Hotel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Swanky hotel with beautiful weather even though i hate small talk <laughs> the yeah. weather was on point well we did it's kind of funny because when we got together we did kind of go through a little series of pastimes of that small talk yeah and yeah. then we kind of grew into like a more intimate conversation yeah you're yeah. right that great observation mm-hmm. it's like I guess it's like the buildup in my mind that I know this isn't going to be the entire conversation that makes it tolerable uh, okay. for yeah. me. Or I'm like, yeah. We can. You're like, I know Zach. This is going to yeah, turn into something turn more to, deep. Exactly. Than and I'm going to go oh, home shitting. and think yeah. about it all night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have my like brain just churning. <laughs> yeah. Well, this definitely has my brain churning. And yeah. I've been thinking about all of the games that I play. And um, yeah. It's a it's a great book. Yeah, this is awesome. Good good pick. Yes. Well, thanks for doing it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for listening to Unpacking Ideas. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with a friend or scroll down and write us a review or give us a rating. All that stuff helps, so thanks for doing that in advance. If you would like to get in touch with me or to hear about what's coming up next on the podcast, visit unpackingideas.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you would like to hear more from my guest, Sonia, check her out on TikTok and Instagram. She's an influencer over there, does all kinds of really cool content around self-development, psychology, attachment styles. Uh, So definitely check out Sonia. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for listening, and I will see you next episode.